Welcome to the Total Connector Show. My name is Kevin Davani. My very special guest is Mike Harris from Veterans Today. Mike, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming to my show. How are you doing? Okay, well, th thanks for having me. You and I have been friends and friendly for a long time. So uh, glad to finally be on your show here. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs> Um, Mike, I'm going to uh, do a very short introduction on you. Um, I mean, you can do it yourself, but uh, I know you personally, you're sort of, from, for me, you're an out-of-box thinker, and uh, you're, you know, you've got a lot of specializations, and uh, why don't you just introduce yourself, because you have, you know, such a broad spectrum of, of knowledge of, you know, uh, geopolitics, uh, applied technology, uh, I mean, what have you. Could you just give you a short introduction, please? Thank you. Well, boy, it's an interesting question where to start. I, I spent the majority of my career uh, in the technology sector, uh, primarily in the semiconductor industry. But due to uh, uh, the USA inviting China into uh, GATT, uh, the World Trade Organization, and NAFTA, all of those industries now reside in China. The, the US uh, has been part of the deindustrial that was planned by George H.W. Bush and implemented by William Jefferson Clinton, uh, which are really two treasonous acts uh, against the U.S. as a sovereign nation in favor of the globalist agenda. So I found myself, uh, you know, without a job, essentially. And so uh, I met uh, Gordon Duff and several of the other uh, gentlemen from Veterans Today, and they invited me to participate with them, which I uh, gladly accepted. And um, I'm the kind of guy that I can see through the, the BS that the mainstream media puts out, and it, it is BS. I, I look at trends in this country that have happened since uh, uh, the Kennedy murder. Um, you know, I, I look at you know just terrible things that have been done to the United States uh, to, to weaken the country and to blend us into the the, the globalist uh, agenda. And so uh, I, I kind of call them as I see them. And, you know, I, I'm a, a 12th generation American. You know, my family's lived here for a very long time. We're not one of these new immigrants uh, whose dad brought us over when we were five years old and now we call ourselves Americans. I'm not one of those. I'm one of the, my family helped build this country. They, they uh, you know, were from the ground up. And so my perspective on this is that of a true American, not of these faux Americans, uh, these Jewish Americans and others who came over here since World War II, and now they're waving the flag like they, they're telling me what the American way is. That's not the American way. Uh, it, it's what they're trying to morph the American way into to fit their agenda, which is uh, diametrically opposed to the agenda of true Americans. So anyway, um, what else you know? I, I know my uh, little bio you put up there says uh, martial artist. I've been a practicing karate uh, band for uh, 50 years now <laughs> and I still train on a, on a you know probably four days a week well, so uh, I, I still love it still train uh, I've got the residual of a black eye right here from a training accident two weeks ago Monday and uh, you know love the sport but it's changed from a sport for me uh, to a, a survival skill and that is something you, you never know when you're walking down the street alone and uh someone wants to take your wallet or do you harm? And so, uh, okay, <laughs> bring it on. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's kind of my attitude. I think I might have a surprise for them for uh, uh, someone of my age. Uh, you know, you get these young, uh, tough guys out there, things are full of it. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. All right, as you said, Mike, uh, you cut pretty good to the bullshit and, you know, with your team, you, I mean, uh, the, the thing I admire about you guys is that you go really into deep into the investigative uh, research. And when it comes to, you know, um, uh, you know researching, acquiring knowledge and uh, interconnecting the dots with one another. So the, the focus of our talk is, uh, is, um, is going to be Epstein, or I call him Epstein, <laughs> whatever the pronunciation is, Epstein. So... Um, it's really weird. I mean, what I just don't get, it's not the first time that we had heard about, you know, all these pedophilia networks or uh, abuse uh, or, you know, um, blackmailing extortion materials on on a range of people. I mean, from whatever, lawmakers, politicians, uh, even, I don't even know, you know, I mean, other prosecutors involved, uh, heads of state. 
intelligence operations, uh, secret service operations, how deep, I mean, do we have to go into this rabbit hole? And was this really a suicide, do you think, in your opinion? Or was it all a setup? I mean, who can do this kind of thing? You asked about eight questions right there. Exactly. <laughs> it's your floor. It's your stage. Go ahead. So let's break it down into single questions. All right. Now, let's go back to veterans today. What makes veterans today unique, and this is something that most people miss, we're not just veterans from the United States. We're veterans from every military organization around the world. Uh, we have veterans from Russia. We have veterans from Afghanistan. We have veterans from uh, South Africa. We have veterans from uh, the, the, the UK. We have veterans from uh, Europe, the EU, France. So we have a very unique set of viewpoints of not just the USA's military, but military men from around the world who have different perspectives on what the problems are. That's one thing. Now, the thing that really, really gives veterans today its true value is that we do not rely on the controlled and contrived news services. We don't rely on Reuters. Um, we have boots on the ground. We have people there who we talk to who know us, uh, who, who may be one of us. And so that gives us a very unique perspective that we're not being told what happened. We have people there who have seen what happens and, and what, what, the, what the true backdrop is. So that allows us to cut through a lot of the BS and, and really get to the heart and, and, and core of what's really, really going on uh, wherever it is. So that's, uh, that, is, that is the advantage that we don't rely on an organization like Reuters who can put an editor in place who will filter the news and tell it with the narrative that the global that supports the globalist agenda. So we, we really, like I said, we, we, we cut through it. We'll, we'll give you the truth as we know it and as we've heard it from people we know and we trust. And that's, that's the major difference between Veterans Today and any other news organization or intelligence organization in the world. So mm -hmm. that's, that's now, now let's go back to this Epstein, Epstein character. Um, let's start with simple questions. What do you want to know? And I'll, I'll give you a knowledge to the best of my ability. All right. Uh, so, okay, let's re, uh, let me, help me a little bit recapitulate the whole story. Um, a month ago, um, uh, Epstein was in his uh, prison cell and uh, allegedly uh, he, he was sort of, uh, he, he was under uh, um, the, the, I don't know who was it, Department of Justice prosecutor uh, ordered the uh, full total surveillance on him because he had allegedly attempted to commit suicide. I don't even know whether to trust that source. Well, Go ahead. Stop. What's because, the story? Yeah. Well, because Epstein at the time said that he had been attacked and they attempted to murder him. Mm -hmm. He, he uh, according to his own statement, Epstein never tried to commit suicide. Okay. That is the imposed narrative to set him up for a potential murder okay. later that they could then blame on suicide. But Epstein himself never uh, said, oh, yeah, I was down, I was depressed, I tried to quit. No, he, he said he was attacked. And so that's, that there's, there's the first discrepancy in the story. So let's, let's be very clear about this. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so. um, let's go a little bit earlier uh, to that story. It wasn't, you know, uh, I don't know, I remember when, when that was, like a couple of years ago, uh, the stories already came out that there were, you know, the island, whatever, the, this island where they did all their uh, whatever sexual abuse stuff or, or uh, raping or, uh, I don't know, f flying over people like Clintons and other, you know, high league people. Um, it wasn't the first time that these stories came out. So what happened or what triggered the, you know, the, uh, the prosecution of, of Epstein? I mean, what triggered it? Trump. Okay. <laughs> The, the, uh, the, the Trump administration. Now, let, let's go back and look at Epstein, where he comes from. Allegedly, he's this billionaire, financier, hedge fund manager. Um, nobody on Wall Street ever did business with him. 
know, his money came from somewhere else. Uh, he had a benefactor, this guy named Wexner, who was tied into what's called the Mega Group, which is a group of 20 Jewish billionaires who um, have been manipulating the United States now for decades uh, through, through their actions. And, uh, you know, that the Bronfman family is involved. Um, you know, I don't know if you know the Bronfmans, but they were the ones who were supplying uh, liquor, alcohol to Al Capone uh, during Prohibition in the U.S., mm -hmm. made their billions. They own the Seagram's uh, portfolio of companies and all the brands. Uh, very, very wealthy, very Jewish, very pro-Israeli. And really what we've watched over a number of decades is the infiltration and corruption of the United States government by Jewish uh, billionaire activists in the United States uh, who have uh, compromised through uh, human compromise, you know, by putting politicians, business leaders, uh, religious leaders, anybody they needed uh, their, their influence uh, into situations with uh, underage children or, you know, you know sexual situations with, with young girls, young boys, in order to blackmail them, to get them to do what, they, what they've done. Now, you look at what I will call the schizophrenic uh, foreign policy that the U.S. has, we, we're always ranting and raving about how our best ally, Israel. Um, Israel is not an ally of the U.S., uh, today is an American citizen. A, a, you know, my family's lived here for a long time, uh, you know, hundreds of years. You know, we wake up and we find ourselves as really in uh, Zionist occupied uh, government here uh, because the Zionists have taken over our government. Uh, they determine what our foreign policy is. They determine why we're, we're supporting Israel when it's, it's really, you know, counterintuitive for us. It's against our best interest. We would have a much more robust and proactive, favorable foreign policy to U.S. interests if we would just uh, jettison Israel and uh, look at them as just a, an independent third party. Uh, instead, we allow Israel to get away with murder of Palestinians. I mean, you look at how we, you know, uh, frowned upon Saddam Hussein for what he did to his people, but yet you have wholesale murder on a daily basis of uh, Israelis murdering Palestinian, you know, children, women and children daily. And uh, we don't say a word about it. They, oh, they're our best ally. They're our closest friend. But, you know, I, I, I ask myself and I ask all of your listeners to look at this and examine what does the U.S., how does the U.S. benefit from a relationship with Israel? We don't. They're, 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 they're a liability. They're, they're nowhere near an asset. They're, 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 they're the worst thing that ever happened to us. They're a boat anchor around our neck, and we're trying to swim. <clears throat> if, if we could just liberate ourselves from involvement with Israel at all, I mean, Israel wants to be a sovereign country. Fine, be sovereign. Quit meddling in our politics. And they're able to do this because we have the largest Jewish population on the planet resides in the USA. And one thing about Zionists, well, Jews and Zionists in particular, is they're not afraid to do unethical things by any standard, anyone's standard, any human decency standard. They'll do unethical things, human compromise for one, murder for another, blackmail, uh, bribery, corruption of all sorts. This is how they exert their influence. I mean, you have to look at what the Jewish population of the world is. We've got a global population of 7.2, 7.3 billion people. There's only 13.3 billion Jews on the whole planet. If those numbers are correct, they may be underplaying their numbers. Uh, that, that's something else they'll do. They'll manipulate uh, things like this. But why does such a small group have such a huge impact on what goes on in the United States and what goes on globally. And it's, it's because of their business practices are criminal in, in every way, shape, and form. Uh, their, their religious book, uh, the Babylonian Talmud, tells them that this is okay. They have convinced themselves that they're God's chosen people. I don't know what God that is because my concept of God as a kind and benevolent God is a little bit different than the behaviors that they show. And uh, they, they, they seem to be uh, worshiping a different God than what uh, most Christians and most uh, Muslims uh, see as, as, our, as our divine benefactor uh, because of how 
the behaviors that that they, they display are not kind. They're 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 cruel, and they're very very ruthless people. And that's just the bottom line. And uh, if you discuss these things in public anywhere on the planet, you're branded as an anti-Semite. But you have to remember that 90% of those who call themselves Jews have no Semitic blood at all. Uh, they're, they're the Khazars uh, from, from the Khazarian Empire, which was crushed by Persia and the Russians uh, in the 9th and 10th century. And uh, so that, that's where they come from. They're, uh, they were formerly a sect of Baal worshippers who, who converted to Judaism. And uh, it's my contention that deep down, they're still ball worshipers. Uh, they just pretend like they're, 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 you know, they're, they're worshiping the same God of uh, Islam and, and Christianity. But truly, it's, it's something else that, uh, that, they are, that, that they're beholden to. So. Mm -hmm. When you say uh, President Trump, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, the president, the role of the president, the office of the president of the United States <laughs> is, uh, I don't know whether you agree with me, you know, it's just another, I mean, how much power does a president have? He got to play along. So the only thing I can think of is that President Trump is able or is so intelligent enough to play along like, you know, like a puppet. Uh, but how much power does a president have to, or is he really a chess player? What has, I mean, you know, uh, when we talk about the deep state and all the intricacies, how deep does this go? I mean, are we at the brink of, of, an, of a precipice of a, you know, like a crushing system? Is the system really crushing in and is right in the right place at the right time? Well, let me give you a couple of, of, of things, some, some background here. Let's go to George H.W. Bush and let's look at who he is and how long he was involved in government. We know George H.W. Bush was in Daly Plaza the day that John F. Kennedy was murdered. Okay, we know he was there. We can put him there. We've got photographs. He was there. Uh, he then became a director of the CIA. Uh, he was named as Ronald Reagan's vice president, where he served for eight years. He then served uh, as president for four years, was defeated by William Jefferson Clinton, who uh, he was Clinton's handler, because Clinton was a CIA asset. Then his own son took over and uh, ran for eight years. And then Obama, another CIA asset, was put in place as president. And so you've got 40 plus years, maybe longer, that George H.W. Bush and those around him had to pack the entire U.S. government with people who are loyal to them and their ideology. Okay? So if you've got bottleneck positions, um, whether it's at Department of Justice, whether it's at Department of Defense, whether it's at uh, Department of uh, Health and Human Services, any department in the government, there is a Bush or Clinton or Obama appointee someplace in there that shares the agenda, this globalist agenda. Now remember, the globalist agenda is the Jewish agenda. Globalism is communism under a different name. Okay? So, You've got these people who've been in place for a long time. Uh, they can serve in government for 20, 30, 40 years. And this whole thing has been packed. Every bottleneck position where a decision can, what crime to prosecute, uh, A or B, can be influenced by someone who's appointed and loyal to that globalist agenda. That's what Trump inherited. And so Trump is going through the motions. We watch what's going on with the FBI and the Department of Justice and that madness. And you look at why was that uh, the first one that, uh, that, that Trump took on? Because it's the most critical. Because if he can reform and clean out and purge the Department of Justice and get true Americans in there who are loyal to the sovereignty of the United States, the, the Constitutional Republic of the United States, and if you can do that, then you can go on and clean out every other organization, every other department within the U.S. government. And that is what Trump has undertaken very, very wisely. And I, I think that's the direction he's going. I think that's what he's trying to do here. But you look at the mass of the, of the U.S. government, just the incredible mass, the number of people that are in there. 
uh, this is a Herculean task. This is like uh, trying to clean the Augie and Staples. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, something that, that isn't going to be done easily or overnight because it took them 40 to 50 years to put all this in place. And it's going to take some time to clean it out. And uh, what you're seeing, all this pushback, all this vitriol against Trump is a direct result of the fact that the, the deep state is scared because he may undo their 50 years worth of work. And uh, hopefully for domestically, you know, the, the prosperity and peace of the USA, I hope he's successful, as well as the prosperity and peace of the rest of the planet. Now, if you remember before he was elected, Trump came out and said, we need better relations with Russia. So what did, what did they do? They invented a Russiagate scandal in order to, to keep him distanced from Russia. You know, uh, I, I think that the U.S. and Russia should be the strongest of allies. Uh, an alliance with Russia would do far more good to the people of the U.S. and the people of the world than an alliance with Israel. <laughs> so uh, do the math and, and, and look at how deeply infiltrated the United States has been by the Israelis. And you go back to, uh, I'll go back to John F. Kennedy again. He, he uh, signed an executive order which demanded that APAC, uh, the, the predecessor of APAC, register as a foreign agent doing business in the U.S. And he was murdered three weeks later. And a week after that, Lyndon Johnson reversed the executive order. And we've had this Israeli influence running amok in Washington, D.C. and the rest of the U.S. because it's infiltrated down. It's not just Washington, D.C. anymore. It's every state house, uh, every state government now has got the same Israeli influence in it, uh, just on a smaller scale, uh, depending on the state. But they have thoroughly infiltrated the, every government in the U.S., and they are, they're a plague, they're a cancer, they're, they're a virus that's infected everything. And uh, the American people are waking up and it, we're, we're starting to uh, clean house. We're starting to, to, to sweep up the mess. And, uh, you know, if, if we're successful, great. And if we're not successful, I fear there will be a civil war within the U.S. Uh, within the next uh, two to four years. Yeah. Uh, one thing about uh, John F. Kennedy, I mean, uh, there were, I think, a couple of factors that were culminating uh, or converging somehow. Mm -hmm. It was also the other executive order that he was already he had already signed or planned to sign about the monetary, you know, U.S. Federal Reserve System that's privately owned yes. and controlled. So yes. there's a lot of things going on, and there's even uh, declassified documents about Marilyn Monroe that uh, you know that it literally says well, that she has to be taken care of or something like that. So you know, what well, do you think? Let me, let me interject here. There, there's sure. a number of uh, you know, uh, John F. Kennedy was adamant with Israel that you will not have a nuclear program. Uh, adamant about it. And they were going to cut off all aid and, and disown Israel if they didn't abandon their, their nuclear program. Well, we all know that Demona is there and it's up and running. We know they have between 200 and 500 nuclear warheads. And, um, you know, but yet the U.S. has a law that says we will not do business with any party that has not signed the Non-Proliferation Treaty, but yet we're disobeying our own laws and we're supporting Israel uh, in every possible manner. Why is that? Uh, it, it's, 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 a, it's a contradiction, uh, U.S. law versus U.S. reality. Uh, the other issue is, is that the Federal Reserve has been what powers and what enables this Jewish influence, this Zionist influence around the world. Because if you had access to unlimited monetary uh, printing and using the U.S. as the global reserve currency, um, who can't you buy? What can't you influence? I mean, if there is a God in, in this three-dimensional reality we live in, it's money. Because nothing happens without money. You, 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 I mean, you, uh, you can't even live on the street as a beggar without money. And so... Uh, when you have control over essentially what is the global currency, um, you have a lot of power and a lot of influence. And, and so when JFK uh, signed uh, that, that executive order that uh, commanded the printing of other currency, uh, U.S. Treasury notes versus Federal Reserve notes, that was uh, another uh, contributing factor that uh, you know, accelerated the, the trigger and blowing his head off. Mm -hmm. Right. So.
So going back to Epstein, Epstein, Epstein. Um, now, uh, there was an article that asked the question, you know, in the end it said like uh, something like who uh, investigates the investigators or, you know, you could say the prosecutors or the Department of Justice, anybody that is sitting on those piles on those, you know, treasure troves of, yeah, of uh, blackmailing extortion materials. Uh, what happens to the witnesses? Because it's not the first time the witnesses have just vanished or just suicided. Uh, allegedly, <laughs> with two bullets in the head. So, how many how many witnesses are gonna die? Do you think realistically? I mean, this is how realistic is yeah. this that we're gonna you know break this apart? I mean, or, or Trump well, with his team? Well, I, I don't know what I don't know. First of all, Epstein was too valuable of an asset mm -hmm. to um, to have a lot been allowed to stay at that facility. He should have been in a supermax prison, isolated on a U.S. military base not in a, in a downtown facility in, in Manhattan. You know, the joke in the United States is it's not New York City, it's New York City because of the inordinate influence that they have over every aspect of life in, in that uh, jurisdiction. So whoever made the decision to leave him there was negligent and foolish, and that needs to be examined. But I've heard two theories. One of them is that, yes, he's really dead, and that it was an Israeli Mossad operation uh, using assets that they've had and purchased in the U.S. for a long time, deep, deep cover assets that allowed him to be murdered in his cell. That's one. And the other is that, and there, there's two, uh, there's a, a facet A and a facet B to this. One of them is, is that he is not really dead, but has been spirited away and out of the prison and is now happily uh, relaxing in Israel on a beach where he's going to have his name changed and his face surgically altered so he doesn't look the same and uh you will never see or hear from him again uh but he's going to live a, a life of luxury until his day he dies because of the the good intelligence leverage that he gave over uh u.s politicians that that's one theory the other theory is is that this was a u.s military operation and that they got him out of there and he is now being held in a secure location where he cannot be gotten to while he testifies uh, in, and gives all the goods. In the name uh, of you, national security, Matt Mike. Of, yeah. So you can do anything under, under the name of national security, right? I mean, oh, you can yeah, give yeah, any yeah. kind of orders, right? Yes, yeah, 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 yes, you can. But, you know, in, in reality, I don't know which of those three scenarios is true. I hope it's number three. I hope that he is in the, uh, the, the, the tender custody of, of U.S. <laughs> hands who are loyal to the United States, uh, who, who believe in the sovereignty of the Republic of the United States of America, and have not sold out to the globalist Zionist uh, enterprise that's trying to dominate the world. But the value in Epstein is not just that he had the blackmail materials. And that's very valuable because you look at Many of the decisions the U.S. has made, the Congress, the Senate, the judiciary, the, you know, the, the Supreme Court, you know, all these decisions that you look at and say, what were they thinking? This does not benefit the people of the United States in one. one there's no manner this benefits the, the people of the U.S.A. What were they thinking? They were thinking they were covering their hide because they were being blackmailed because they have uh, recordings of them having sex with underage children. That, that, that's, what, that, that's what the Zionists do. It's what they've always done. They, they, these are truly evil people. And they need to be taken to task and held accountable for what, what they have done. But the value in Epstein is not just the materials he had, but the motivation for exercising those materials. Why did they want Senator Smith from uh, Louisiana to vote this way on this bill? What was the what was the end game? What were they really thinking? And if we can start to unravel that, we'll begin to understand a lot more about what the Zionist globalist plan is to take over the planet. And maybe we can uh, start to thwart them in, in more than one area. I mean, I'll, I'll give you a, a prime example. Uh, you look at uh, Victoria Nuland and what she did in Ukraine under the Obama administration. You know, toppling the Yanukovych a government there that was duly elected and very popular. I was in Ukraine uh, during 2004 during the Orange Revolution, and Viktor Yanukovych was an extremely popular leader. I remember being woken up in my hotel room in Odessa, looking out the window, 
and there was a parade going down there with marching bands and the whole shot, and probably 25,000 people marching through the, through the streets in support of Yanukovych. And yet, Newland came in there uh, and spent five billion U.S. taxpayer dollars to topple his regime. Uh, that shouldn't be possible, but that's what the U.S. does with the Zionist influence, influencing our Department of State, and, and it really, like I said, every other factor of government in this country. They get what they want as long as it benefits Israel. And what they were trying to do, and what they've been trying to do, is take back Ukraine because that is the Ashkenazi Jews' homeland. That is, that is the homeland of ancient Khazaria. Mm -hmm. And so they, they want their homeland back. Uh, so they're, they're, they're making their moves. And uh, you're, you're watching this going on. You're watching the pushback from people around the world. Look what's going on in Hong Kong. It's barely even reported here in the USA. We don't mm -hmm. hear much about it. Yeah. Uh, but you know, like I said, I'm part of Veterans Today. We've got, we have assets on the ground over there who send us video of millions of people in the yep. street. You look what's going on in France Amazing. with the Yellow Vest. Yeah. Uh, it's been going over 35, 37 weeks now. Every weekend they're out there protesting and protesting and protesting. They want France to be France. Yeah. They, but, don't want the, yeah. they don't want the influx of, of all these immigrants coming in. They want their own sovereign country yeah. for their own sovereign people. But that's the that's beauty of the internet. They can't censor it anymore. I mean, you see all those millions in Hong Kong, I mean, fighting for freedom, you know, a liberty, you know, human rights, actually. It's, it's, it's so simple. Right. Well, let, let, me, let me give you something uh, big here. Uh, we have a very, very high level source within the city of London, uh, which is really the, the global banking center. And it's the Zionist banking center of the world. And so, but the global source our source within the city of London has told us two things about the USA. Number one, get the guns away from the American citizens by the end of 2019 or we will withdraw your support and expose you for the traitors that you are. They've been told that. And they've been told to shut down the internet for all alternative media sources that they bring a free and a dispassionate view that is outside the propaganda narrative that the globalists are wanting to, to promote. So those are two things that are direct orders from the, the banking center of the city of London uh, to their operatives within the U.S. to shut it down, shut it off. And they've got to the end of this year to do it. And that's why you're seeing things heat up exponentially here within the USA uh, is, is because these are orders from the guys who write the checks. These are the, these are the British uh, the city of London bankers. And so right. that, that's what's going on. So we, we've got, whenever I get information from a source of this quality, I believe it. And then a week later, what happens? We have two back-to-back -back mass shootings. <laughs> yeah. uh, what a it, coincidence. Yeah. What a coincidence. And, you know, then you look at the internet, we've got witnesses in the El Paso shooting. I, I've watched the tapes myself. We have at least three witnesses who said, there were three or four men dressed in all black, all shooters. And they came in and were shooting. But yet that has been scrubbed from the internet as quick as, as they could get it. The videos are still available. I've got, I recorded one uh, myself. I've got it so that we've got a source out there that says, an eyewitness saying, no, and she's speaking all in Spanish. No, I saw four men with guns coming in shooting. And so you know, one guy going in there he would have to be a very, very expert marksman to take out that many people that quick. But four guys could do it. And so what, what we're being told is a lie. All of these mass shootings, bar none, have yeah. been what I call Gladio-style operations, yeah. where they come in, um, government, paramilitary type forces come in, they commit an atrocity that is horrendous, like the mass shootings. And the purpose of it is to uh, impact the the thinking of the American people and say, well, you know, maybe they're right. Maybe guns are bad. This is happening more and more often. We can't live like this. Yes, let's give up the Second Amendment. Let's give up our right to defend ourselves. And some of us out here and say, nah, we're not going to do that. Uh, you know, you're going to have to uh, come get them. 
as they said, Mulan Labe, that was what the king of Sparta said to the, uh, to the Persian king who was trying to take them down at the uh, Battle of Thermopylae. And so, you know, know your history, know who we are, know where we come from. And the question I have for every American citizen out there is that if you're sitting at home some evening and you see the SWAT team pull up in your neighbor's house and they're going to kick down his door to take his guns, and you're armed, but they're not at your door yet. What do you do? And my contention is that if you see that happening to your neighbor, you have an obligation to shoot the SWAT team in the back and put them in a, in a crossfire that they were not expected in order to protect your own Second Amendment rights. This is what Americans have to start doing. Now, I, don't, I support law enforcement 110%, but when law enforcement is in violation of the U.S. Constitution, which is the highest law of the land, then law enforcement has become the outlaws themselves. And that is why we have a second amendment, is to prevent government from overreaching and becoming an outlaw government, becoming a tyranny itself. And so this is the conundrum that we as law-abiding American citizens find ourselves in. What do we do? I mean, do we just let them disarm us and, and, and become slaves? I mean, look what the Bolsheviks did in Russia and uh, in the Russian Revolution, you know, 1916 through 1917. Uh, they killed over 100 million Russian Christian citizens. And in addition to killing, they stole all of their property. And you wonder why we have rich Jewish oligarchs. <laughs> I mean, because they stole the wealth of 100 million people. That's how they got their wealth. They did the same thing in the Armenian Genocide. Uh, it, it got blamed on the Turks because it happened in Turkey and they used Turkish forces, but it was a Jewish inspired, uh, uh, you know, slaughter, genocide. And I've, I've talked to many of my Armenian friends, they've not forgotten, they've not forgiven, and they know who it was, they know who did it to them. And that is what we're facing in the U.S. We have, if we're not careful, we will have an approaching red tear inflicted upon the citizens of the United States. And I'll guarantee you the, the radical left in the United States will have no problem killing the 63 million deplorables that voted to put Donald Trump in office. I'm one of those deplorables, and uh, I will not go quietly. And I hope the other 63 million will not either. That, uh, that if, if they're going to pull it in this country, uh, they're gonna have a fight on their hands. And that is the critical reason why the Zionists wish to disarm America. Mm -hmm. Let me blame a couple other things on them. You know, we, we hear a lot about the immigration problems in Europe and in the USA. These are not inspired. The French aren't looking to bring in more Muslims and uh, black Africans into France. You know, the, the, uh, the Germans aren't looking to do it. Uh, we in the U.S., we don't need any more Mexicans or Central Americans here. We've got plenty. We want the ones we have to go home. This is all Jewish Zionist inspired. This is all to weaken the, the native populations, to make them a minority population within their own country so they lose influence and cannot control their own destiny. Mm -hmm. Because by being a sovereign people, whether you're French or Polish or, or you know, Lithuanian, whatever, if you're a, a sovereign people with your own place, your own country, you're not going to invite this in. Uh, you want to run your own affairs. You want, we want to mind our own business. We, 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 want, we want to raise our kids. We want to have a decent job. We want to do what, what it takes to survive. We don't want, want any of this. This is being imposed upon us. We're not looking for this fight, but we have nowhere to run from this fight. So it's given us no choice but to fight on our own ground, to fight in our own country. And, and, and this is what's coming. This is what we're, as Americans, as Europeans, as, as white people around the world, this is what we're looking square in the eye. And we didn't want this. We didn't bring this upon ourselves. This has been imposed upon us by the, by, by, by the Jewish billionaires, by the oligarchs. And, and this is what they're doing in their attempt to gain control of the planet. So Beautiful. Well, so, uh, Mike, I mean, let's zoom out a little bit more. Um, I wanted to have you take in the last uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes we have. 
uh, I don't want to drag it too long so we don't overwhelm our <laughs> listeners. Um, what do you think geopolitical macroeconomically? You know, I'm a big advocate and fan of Bitcoin. I've, you know, I have a separate podcast just for Bitcoin, Austrian economics. Everything's been going on right now. I mean, this is unprecedented. I mean, this debt bubble, the negative yielding debts, the, uh, you know, steering into recession, maybe even inflation, hype inflation, what, what have you? I mean, the, everything is going on in Iran right now. Uh, Russia having their military, security, economical stranglehold at the Persian Gulf, China. Uh, what is this? I mean, is this a puppet show, or or what? what what's what's the agenda behind? What, what's what's the end game here? Well, as I've said, the end game for the globalists is to control the the entire global economy and to, to control the planet. Now, you look at existing today. There's 147 interlocking financial firms that control 80% of global commerce. Yeah, that's a study that. about that. Yeah, I know, yeah. That, that, well documented. And yeah. so they're, they're going after the last 20%. The Iranians have always been allies of the US. Now the US screwed up big time in 1953 when they deposed the duly elected prime minister and, and installed the Shah. The US screwed up. But you look at what else happened six years earlier. Oh. We created Israel, and Harry Truman took a $2 million bribe in order to, uh, to recognize Israel, all right? So that was the beginning back then. And the, the Iranian people haven't started a war with anybody in over 300 years. Um, I like the Iranian people. They, they've always been kind to me. They've always been good. They're, they're, they're brilliant thinkers. They're, they're great innovators. Do I like Islam so much? I don't understand is Islam uh, enough. I, I truly don't. Would I rather see Iran be a secular government run by the Iranian people in a duly elected fashion? Absolutely, without any outside meddling. And if they wanted to elect uh, Islamic uh, candidates, that's fine. Do what you want. It's your country. Live it the way you want. But if you don't, should be separated. Uh, you know, religion is. You know, I think it should be obsolete. Yeah. But anyway, that's my opinion. But, but, yeah. But, but but right now, Iran is run by a theocracy, and I appreciate what they're trying to do. Now, the reason that Israel in the U.S. in the West has such animosity toward Iran is because they've been the first country to be successful in kicking out the Western Rothschild banking system and still standing and still surviving and still prospering. And so what, what they want to do is they want to crush Iran and make an example of them so everyone else is too afraid to try to do the same thing. Now you have Venezuela down in uh, South America um, trying to do the same thing, you know, kick out the Western uh, banking influence which is really the source of all evil. It goes back to the Federal Reserve, which is forward owned by, by the Rothschild banking cartel. And you, you, that is why there's so much animosity towards Iran is because they're the first to successfully throw off the yoke of slavery of the Western banking system. And they don't want anybody else to throw off the, the yoke of slavery either because without if, if two can do it, then three can do it, then 10 can do it. The next thing you know, the Rothschild, uh, you know, Jewish banking system is defunct and they don't want that. They'll do anything to keep that from happening. So uh, that, 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 that is a piece of the puzzle right there. But uh, as far as Bitcoin, I think investing in Bitcoins is probably prudent right now. I think the last thing you want to be holding is uh, paper money from any jurisdiction does not have gold backed. Um, I would invest in physical gold. I would invest in Bitcoins. I would invest in any tangible assets, whether it's real estate, farmland, um, you know, apartment buildings, office buildings, anything that is tangible, as well as equipment. If you can go out and buy yourself a Caterpillar tractor and a, and a dump truck, uh, you can start a business moving dirt. You can do something, something that people need to have done. Uh, and, and those are the type of assets that, that people should own. And the last final and maybe most important in the U.S. asset to own right now is firearms and lead, you know, firearms and ammunition to, to fund them. Because I truly believe that the U.S. has, we're at the tipping point right now, whether we're going to go into a civil war or not. I think we'll know within the next six months uh, if there's going to be actually a hot civil war. There's been a, 
um, a cold civil war going on since Trump was elected. But is it really going to go hot? Are we going to have Americans fighting each other in the streets? That I don't know. I, I hope I don't find out. But I would uh, make sure that I was well armed and well supplied with, with ammunition as well. But th those are the investments that I would look at uh, if, if I had uh, spare money to, to invest anywhere in the world right now. Yeah. So. so the monetary financial crisis that we're heading to, I mean, it could even happen over here in Europe, in the Euro European Union, that the, I could, it could, it, there was a lot of experts, it's not me saying that, a lot of experts are saying, um, you know, the banking crash or whatever comes up, uh, it's, it's not, you know, it's not sustainable anymore. It's, uh, the euro could crash before the dollar could even crash. It, it could, and Deutsche Bank's in deep trouble. I mean, you know, Deutsche Bank is in really, really bad trouble. Uh, you look at all of the major banks. I mean, the, the, the number five bank in China is in deep trouble. The number three bank in China is in deep trouble. They're both technically insolvent, but the Chinese government won't admit it. Uh, they're going to keep propping them up and keep pumping money into them because they don't want to lose face. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, China has problems. Uh, Europe has problems. The U.S. has problems. You know, the, we're at the end of the, of the road for the Western debt-based banking system. So yep. much debt has been created around the planet that the GDP of the planet is not sufficient to service the interest on the debt. Ergo, it all needs to be put into receivership and it all needs to be washed away and, and somehow re-engineered. That, that, that is something that must, must be done. We need a new global financial order, whether it's based on a basket of currencies, whether it's based on a basket of commodities, whether it's based on Bitcoin, I don't know. I can't predict. I've not been invited to those meetings, but uh, something needs to be done and done soon because it's going to be hardship uh, for all. I, I would recommend that people start stockpiling things, food and water, of course, but other things like medicines. If you can go out and lay in a, a supply of antibiotics and the system crashes, sick people will pay you exorbitant amounts of money if they get pneumonia and need uh, penicillin to, to treat it. There, there's a lot of things that people can be doing. There's gonna be a lot of uh, opportunities to, to pick up valuable assets for next to nothing, for, for things that are valued very, very cheaply today if the supply chain and the, and the ability to transact business commerce uh, comes to an end if it collapses, which I think is, is any day. I mean, any, it, it could be tomorrow, it could be three days from now, it could be three months, three years, but it's certainly not going to be more than five years before it hits the end of the road. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the people of America, I don't know, humanity in general, I think they're waking up. I mean, they're much woke. They're much more conscious and questioning the narrative, the official narrative. Because until now, you know, you, you just, you know, you just stamped uh, conspiracy theories, which is also a definition in the, in the declassified documents of FBI and CIA. When you deviate from the official norm, normative or narrative, you are a conspiracy theorist. So, <laughs> so I think there's, a, as you said, there's a tipping point, I think, coming. I, I can, you know, I can see it. Uh, you know, there's well, more and more questions. It's, it, it's sensing it. We feel it. We all feel yeah, it. Yeah. And, and, and everyone out there, I mean, we still have unanswered questions about 9-11. Why haven't the, the tapes of the jet hitting the Pentagon been released yet? Yeah. Robert Mueller, the guy who investigated Trump, was the guy who seized all of those tapes. Those tapes haven't been destroyed. They still exist. Why haven't we been allowed to see them 20 years, 19 years later? Yeah. Because they don't show a, uh, a jet hitting the Pentagon. It's either a cruise missile or a bomb that went off inside the Pentagon, something else. The narrative is not what they told us. And there, there's two issues. Yes, there's conspiracy theories, but there's also conspiracy facts. And, and a lot of these things that have been branded as con conspiracy theories have, over time, proven out to be conspiracy facts. And no matter how they try to discredit you, and they will, doesn't matter how, stick to the truth. Stick to your discernment. You know, we as human beings have an ability. You know, we, we, we hear something. And you go, that doesn't sound right. That, that, that can't be right. And then you hear something else and say, wow, that's far-fetched, but that really rings true with me. That resonates with me. With my heart. We all have that ability. We all have that innate ability to distinguish fact from fiction. And um, that's really what people have to rely on these days is what, do you, what does your gut tell you? 
What is your intuition saying to you about what's going on? Trust that more than what you, what you see over the mainstream media because they lie. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, in the U.S., it's particularly bad, particularly egregious how they lie. Even Fox News, which is a little bit better than the others, still talks about 9-11 and, and uh, jet airplanes and 19 uh, arrows with box cutters brought down the Twin Towers, which, which we know is a physical impossibility. Yeah. So. Exactly. Wonderful. Um, uh, Mike, I've enjoyed it very much. My listeners um, and, and um, viewers, I'm sure they've learned a lot and it's, it's really da going down the rabbit hole with you every time. So uh, where can people find you if you want to, you know, if they want to read about, you know, your investigative stuff or your, uh, I know you're also a host of this uh, short end of the stick. Yeah. Well, I've, I've, I've taken a sabbatical from that for a while on um, the short end of the stick, but the best place to reach me is through veteranstoday.com. And uh, if you send me an email through there, I will respond. But that, that, that I, I'm trying to stay very, very hidden, low profile, you know, hard to, to, to reach. So uh, please use VT as, as, the, uh, as the venue if you want to get a hold of me. Thank you so much. Mike, it's been a pleasure, an honor. Hope to repeat this sometime soon again, maybe on a, another well, special well, subject. Well, Sure. In, in, in closing, remember, Jeffrey Epstein was a Mossad operation to get human compromise information on business leaders, government leaders, religious leaders, not just in the U.S., but from around the world. That's who Jeffrey Epstein was. Never, ever forget that. And um, this could be a big crack in the case. And, and this, this could help us bring down the Zionist globalist uh, uh, usurpers who are trying to take over our planet. Exactly. Yeah, it's all for humanity. <laughs> That's what we're doing it for. It is, yeah. right? Okay. <laughs> well, anyway, Mike, thank you so much, and I hope to s talk to you soon again. All right? <laughs> thank you. Have a great day. You bye -bye. too. Bye-bye.